like, first of all, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're very excited to have you on. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. So I've been telling everybody, because this is what I believe, you're like the FFL trifecta, okay? Mm -hmm. We do two things here. We sell, we build. You do both of those things at a very high level and also just being plugged into the team culture, which I think is also so important. Um, so Mike, I'd love to kind of, you know, shut up, let you kind of tell the team who you are, your story here, um, you know, any value that you can bring to help us get to where you are. Um, you know, I'd love to kind of just be quiet for a little bit. Sure. Well, I, I appreciate you having me on. Um, you know, I have a kind of a, a crazy story, you know, with FFL and I, I can't uh, stress enough what you talk about being a convention. I, I probably wouldn't still be here. You know, it's one of those things like every year you, you need your batteries recharged, right? We all go through that. And then kind of getting to convention changes everything. So it doesn't matter if I've been going for the last 15, 20 years, I, I would continue to go every year because I think I think we all need it. You know, we, we go through difficult times in this business and then you need that lift up. And then when you get around all the people that are there and everyone is so like-minded and so forth, it really rejuvenates you and makes you realize, you know, why why you're in this business and you just kind of love being around the, the people that you're with. So it's something that I, I agree you have to go. There's never a time that I would miss it. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Um, when you talk about being plugged into the culture, I, I talk to people all the time about that's probably one of the most important things that you can do at the company. I think it's what makes us so unique as a company is our culture, is our training, is our leadership. And without it, we would be just like everyone else. So when people come here and they're not plugged in and they're not on the calls and they're not in the weekly trainings, then I'm like, why are you here? And it's always those people that are that way that, that don't last, they don't make it. And they don't truly understand what it means to be part of FFL. Uh, we just had our call earlier today and I did the same thing at the beginning. I was kind of surprised that we didn't have more people on then I, I kind of just you know stopped the meeting and said everyone let's start texting people and get everyone on the call because I know how important it is if you're not plugged in you're not part of the culture you're just not going to make it and it's it's sad that it's that way but it's that way for, for everyone so it, it is so important when I came to the company back in 2015 it was a fraction of the size that it that it is right now and to say that I was like probably the worst agent that was ever hired by the company and like the history is is probably um, an understatement. I mean, I was just terrible in this business. I came from the mortgage industry and I had my own company for about 12 years. And in, in 2008, I made like $900,000 W-2. So that's like after my expenses, that's clear money, you know, pulling down 90, $95,000 a month. And after a while, you know, when all that went away, I always look back and I always blamed it on 08, like everyone does. And it took me a while to realize it was actually my fault that I lost all that, that I lost the company. It's because I was young, you know, I was 35, 36 years old, making all that money, but I was spending like I was making $10 million a year. So it wasn't that the economy went bad. It's just, I was stupid. You know, I would, I would put, pile a bunch of people into an airplane with, you know, drop 30 grand to fly people to Vegas, or I'd send like five, six limos out at night and pick up all my buddies and we'd go out to dinner and I was just an idiot. So when things got bad, I didn't have any money because I spent it all, you know, so I was stupid. In 08 was actually my best year where a lot of people in the mortgage industry went down. We actually went up. We found a very niche market. We were doing what is called VA streamlines. So we were working with veterans. We were able to take their mortgages and reduce the rates and we made a lot of money. The, the the downturn in the economy actually hit me a couple of years after that. So in, in 08, I made, you know, just under 900,000 W-2. Then 2010, uh, no, 2009 hit, made like a half million. I told my wife, I'm like, we'll, we'll still be okay. Half million is okay money. We, we can get by. And then 2010 happens, I made 60 grand. Like imagine going from $900,000 a year to 60,000. Wife doesn't work, got kids, got bills. I mean, that was tough, right? So then- I, I was looking, I said, what, what else am I going to do? And at that time, I found another insurance company where Sean and Frank and all of them came from, but the commission was so low there. I didn't stay very long. I was there for a couple of months and it was terrible to make 50% and then 35% on final expense. I was like, man, this is awful. Like I was making peanuts compared to what I was used to making. And so I, I, I ended up leaving then. I didn't stay long because it wasn't a lot of money and got back into the mortgage business and started doing okay again, but it certainly wasn't anywhere close to where I used to be. 
2014 rolls around. I see Frank um, and his office was, he, he lives around me. So I saw him post on social media. He needed some help at his office and I knew him. And uh, so I hit him up and I was like, hey man, what do you need help with? I'll, I'll stop by and help you out. And uh, walked in the office and he told me what FFL was doing, told me about the comp, told me about the opportunity. And it was at that point, I just said, I'm out of the mortgage business. I'm not going to just tiptoe on this thing. I'm not going to do it part-time. I'm just going to walk out. And that's what I did. I just, I left the business a hundred percent and didn't want anything to do with it anymore. And I said, I'm going to start something new. So it, 2015 is when I got in with FFL and it was because there's no other industry. There's like nothing else that exists that could even get me back to where I used to be. And I looked around and, and there, there was nothing. And I said, if I ever want to get back to making that kind of money, it has to be the insurance business and it has to be with FFL. So I, I came here. And like I said, I was terrible. I sucked. It was like every day I'd go home and want to quit. I told my wife, like, I, I'm like, I know I worked for the entire week and I know I know I made less than min minimum wage because I worked so many hours and I made no money. But you see the difference with me than most people, and it could be like a blessing and a curse. Um, the, the, the blessing is that my back was against the wall and I had no other opportunity. It's, it's also a curse too, right? I, it would have been nice to be able to just go out and get a job, be able to take care of my family, but I couldn't do that. So when people ask all the time, they're like, well, how'd you do it? How'd you make it? I'm like, I had no choice. Like, what would I do? Just be homeless? Like have my wife and kids on the street and just say I couldn't do it? I was like, no, of course not. I, I'd work 24 hours a day if I had to. And so I, I had to work very, very hard in the beginning. And it was different in 2015. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago, but man, we had like no e-apps. Everything was on paper. My handwriting is probably the worst in the world. No one can read my handwriting. Like always had apps kicked back. You couldn't read my handwriting. And uh, it, we had to come in and fax applications to the damn carriers. And then you didn't even know if they were approved for three or four days. And then we had to go back out and meet with the clients. So it was, it was a completely different situation than, than, than what it is today. But I, I stayed, I didn't quit. And I think a lot of the people that we see that are having success, that's that's what the difference is, right? They just, they didn't quit. And um, I, I kept moving and doing what I had to do and started building a team. But then we all see it, right? We see all these posts on the internet. We see that everyone thinks the grass is greener on the other side. We see all these other opportunities. We see that people talk about how they have the best leads. Um, we see that you shouldn't have to work that hard in the business. So I got caught up in all that. So after coming here and get back on my feet in 2018, I like I, I quit. I walked out because someone told me it was better. Man, Mike, I see how hard you work. You shouldn't have to work that hard. Our leads are better than FFL. You don't have to work like that. So I, I left in 18 and left with my entire team. I had 35 people. We all walked out the same day. And we left to go to what was supposed to be a better opportunity. It took all of like a week to realize it was the worst decision I ever made in my life. The company was absolutely terrible. The training was awful. Like it was, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I like jumped out of the fire right into the right into the pan. And like, it was just awful. And uh, I had to stick it out. So I stayed there. I ended the entire team was gone. It didn't take very long for the entire team to go away. You see, when you're with FFL, it's very easy to have a team because there's all these trainings that are going on. There's so many things that you can plug your people into and you never have to be all things to all people. It's funny now because people will talk about, you're great, you do this, you do that. I go, I'm not good. I just tell people to go to all different places. I'm like, go see Frank, go see Jesse, call this person, call that person, get on that call, get on this training. You really don't have to be good at anything. You just have to know where the information is and point people in the right way. You see, when I went to that other company, none of this stuff existed. There wasn't all these trainings. There weren't live dials. There weren't conventions. And you had to literally be all things to all people, which is something that I'm definitely not. Um, and, and it didn't work real well. So that whole deal just fell apart. So in 2019, and I knew what I was doing. I was talking to a guy that I knew that talked to Sean every day. So I very intentionally told him how terrible it was where I, where I went to because I knew without a shadow of a doubt he would call Sean immediately and tell him. So I did it on purpose. 
And so like an hour after I told him how awful it was where I was, my phone rang and it was Sean. And Sean said, Mike, how are you doing? And I said, Sean, I am doing absolutely terrible. He said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. So I jumped on an airplane, flew him up to Connecticut. And wouldn't you believe after leaving, causing all this trouble in the company, the company wasn't very big back then. So people definitely knew that this guy left with 35 people and caused all this trouble. He literally like was standing there at the office, like with his arms wide open and said, Mike, I welcome you back with open arms, gave me a big hug. We walked into his office. We ended up going out to dinner that night. I think we went to his son's basketball game that night and we talked. And so a lot of times they they see Sean and, and people always say, like, is he really that way? Like he, he he's he's lying when he talks about all he wants to do is help people. That's not he's just interested about money. That's like not true at all, because someone like me who caused all this trouble, he could have easily like not called, didn't care, but he did. So he called me and I met with him. And I came back. Now, keep in mind, I left and man, it, it was so bad there. My comp was like 25 points higher. I think I was at like, a, I was above definitely a 140 there. And I came back here at a 120. So I took a huge pay cut, but I made a lot more money at a lower comp. That's where I kind of learned that comp means nothing, right? You can make a lot of money um, here. It doesn't matter what your comp is. Cause I could have been at 200% at the other company and I still would have died. I still would have fell on my face because it missed everything else. And that's kind of where I learned that companies that offer comp have nothing else to offer. When you have something to offer to people, you don't have to give them everything because you have something of value. So comp means nothing. But when I came back here, I came back here, my mortgage was like three months behind. Um, my gas and electric bill was behind. My cell phone bill was behind. Everything was terrible. But here was the difference. When I came back to the company, it only took three months to hit vice president. It took exactly three months to build a team that could do $150,000 a month. And the only reason that was possible is because I knew um, from when I was here before. So all those things that I learned and as a, a new agent or someone that had too big of an ego, didn't want to listen to, I knew all the right stuff to do. But the difference is when I came back, I chose to put my ego aside and just listen to everything that I was told to do. And I followed exactly what I was told to do. So like Sean gave me the best, uh, the best piece of advice ever. He said, if you want to be a good leader, you must be a good soldier. So I took that to heart. I came back and I did whatever I had to do for the team to help the team get ahead. I knew that when people said, get up in the morning, be up early, right? Back, I remember before, like waking up at nine, 10 o'clock, strolling into the office to 11. And it's funny because even now new agents do it. And I see every new agent that comes through here, through here they all, we all do the same stuff. Right. It takes a while for you to get out of your own way. And we all we all do it. But instead of doing all those things, I just listen. So I would wake up early like we know that we should do. I would get into the office. I'd be in the office at like 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning dialing. I had a talk with an agent earlier and I was like, you're telling me how broke you are. But I didn't see you working on Sunday and I saw you kind of chilling on Saturday. I'm like, you're not really that broke. And if you were then you would do something about it. You wouldn't tell me how broke you are. You would just come in and, and work. It doesn't matter. And I chose to do everything, right? So I woke up early, got to the office early. I recruited. So I came here. And then a week later, I took 35 people to a, a conference that was taking place in Philadelphia. It was like five or six, maybe seven car loads of people, 35 people to a conference. Because I knew, I knew that if I wanted to get out of my financial situation, I had to do two things. I had to go out and sell and I had to sell at a high level. And then I also had to recruit a lot of people. But the only way that I would recruit a lot of people was if I went out and sold because if I was broke and didn't make any money and I complained and whined and, 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 and kept my situation the way it was, no one would ever follow me. So I knew that I had to sell at a high level, but I also had to recruit and bring people in. That's, that's a great, thing too that people understood that or I can tell people now I came back and I'm like my mortgage was behind my bills weren't paid and I still I took a little bit of money I had I bought leads and then I sold and then I took more money and bought leads and I literally bought leads before I did anything else leads came before my the food in my house before my mortgage before anything because I knew that at any point in time I could turn a dollar into five so if I ever got a dollar in my hand, I would never spend it. I needed to multiply it first, then I'd pay my bills. But a lot of people will come in here 
they'll take the money they have, they'll make some money, and then they want to pay their bills first. It's just that they have the wrong mindset. They're still thinking like a W-2 employee. They're thinking like they have a job. They're thinking like they have a paycheck when we have a business. And if that business is hungry and that business is not being fed, then we're going to fail. But learning and being through all that and coming back and knowing all the mistakes that I made is the only reason why those things happen so quickly. So isn't it amazing? Because people say it all the time, right? What would happen? Or could you imagine if you could go back to being 18 years old again, but know everything that you know today, right? Everyone's like, oh my gosh, I'd be a billionaire by now because all the things that I know. So I was able to do that and do things very quickly. So like three months, built a team. We did 150,000 and only did it with like six other people. So I sold a lot. They sold a lot. They only sold a lot because I did. And then three months after that, then we hit SVP. We were doing, you know, 300 grand a month. And then three or four months after that, we hit EVP. So it took 10 months to hit 500,000. And then it took 19 months, no, 23 months to hit board members. So within 19, no, sorry, 23 months, we, we were doing a million dollars a month. But that situation came from coming here, not having any money at all, but just choosing to listen, choosing to follow the system, where before I would always look at the, and people do it every day. You tell them to do things and they don't really want to listen. But when you're in the situation that I'm in, back was up against the wall again. But luckily, I was able to fix it very, very quickly, only because I knew everything. I knew all the right things to do. I knew all the stuff that I was told to do before that I didn't want to listen to. I chose just to put my ego aside, do whatever I could do for the team, do what Sean said, be a good soldier. And that allowed me to very, very quickly get out of that situation and and, and put myself back, you know, upright and then build a million dollar agency. Um, it was like maybe a year and a half ago, I got out of the field. We were, we were close to a million, but I got out. Hello. At that point, not listening completely, because Sean was like, oh, you shouldn't get out of the field. And I was like, oh, we're doing a million. We'll keep growing. Man, this guy's like right with everything he says. So whatever he says, you should just do it. You know, so last year I realized, man, we're not really growing. I need I need to sell again, especially when everyone's coming in doing telesales. And I, I never did telesales. So like last year, again, I was a brand new agent trying to do telesales, struggling on the phone. I'm like, what is this? I can't believe I can't do it. But then I just had to go to it. You see, if I was a brand new agent with the BS that I was going through, trying to learn telesales, I would have quit. But I knew, I'm like, everything is that way. It's hard at first and you got to keep doing it. Then you get better. But literally last year, I only sold over the phone for like six months. And I did 275,000 in six months. Like in November, I did 70,000 all over the phone, all doing telesales, where like seven months prior to that, it was absolutely terrible. But everything we do is that way. And I think it's it's sad that every day that I see people, they come in here and they go through those struggles and then they quit. It's just because they don't understand how good it can be on the other side. Most people don't understand that. And if everyone that we hired realized exactly what they had in their hand, they would treat they would treat the business completely different. If they realize the opportunity that they possess, if they realize exactly what it could do for them, if everyone realized how much their life would change, like they would never give up. They would keep going. They wouldn't stop because they realize how amazing it could be. It's just all the crap we have to go through in the beginning. And when I, the very first time, like I said, it was, I wanted to quit every day and then it was every week and then I got better. And then it was like every month. And then all of a sudden I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm not going to quit. I'm just going to stay. But then I did quit, but then I did come back and then I'll never quit. So like it, it was a crazy journey for me. And if I can do it, like I tell people, I'm like, dude, I came here with like nothing. I go, you tell me you're broke. I'm like, I literally came here after filing a $1 million bankruptcy in 2014. I go, at least you were at zero. I was like a million under you, right? So I was like way, way below you. I would be happy. I would have got on my knees and thank God if I only had like $100,000 in debt. I had a girl come to me today and she's like crying. And I look at her, I'm like a hundred grand. I'm like, dude, I had a million. Like, what are you talking about? Go to work. You can pay that off in the, like the next six months if you chose to. And I said, if you don't do it, it's be it's not because you can't, it's because you don't want to, or you lack the belief in yourself. Both of them you can fix. And the only way you're going to fix the lack of belief in yourself is by working. I go, there's no better way to build your self-confidence 
to build your self-esteem, to build your self-image and going out there and working. Go work, make money, start paying your bills off. You'll feel better and you can knock that debt out. I'm like, it's only a hundred grand. It's nothing. It's no big deal. And you're lucky that you work here because you're, this is probably the only place that you can do that. No regular job, you're going to pay off $100,000 in debt in like less than 12 months. Only here is the only place in the world that you can do that. So be happy that you have this opportunity. Be happy that you're in the situation you're in. Put your back up against the wall and do everything you can. Fight yourself through it. Because I said, only now we're going to find out what you're really made of, right? You think that you're you should be in one place, but you're going to find out where you should really be based off of this situation that you're in. So I know I said an awful lot. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. But that was like the uh, short version, I guess, from beginning to end. That's insane, Mike. Like, that's crazy. And your story is so powerful because I think, I mean, it brings so much perspective, right? Like, I'm like, hey, I started three and a half years ago and we only had, you know, like a couple of Facebook final expense. We didn't even have the ILC, right? When we yeah. first started. And you're like, okay, well, I started and we had to fax our paper apps in. So like, it's just crazy. crazy the opportunity that we have here today, right? And it's like, sometimes you just want to shake people and be like, this is so insane. You have a license to literally print any amount of money you want legally. And it's all about how hard you go to work. So that's huge. Um, I love that you told your story because it brings perspective to what can really happen here. And I think perspective to, you know, you think the problems in your life are bad, you know, well, you, you know, when you a people negative talk, million people talk all the time and they they see where people are and i'm like that's not where they started i go you only see them because now you know they're they're somewhere you didn't see them when they were completely broke and didn't have anything and had to fight through it and then too many times people compare themselves to that person i'm like they weren't always that way you know so um yeah, it happens every day i mean everyone goes through it no one comes here and it's just easy you know everyone kind of goes through the same thing Hundred percent. I love that. So, um, producing at a high level. What would you say is like the logistics, like the actual formula? Like, you know, here's how much I was buying in leads to produce this much. I did that every single week. Were you on dials? Were you? Or do you not get on live dials? Like, what's like if you had to break down, like specifically, an agent gets off this call today and they're like, next month I want to do thirty grand. What does that look like? It's it's always lead flow, right? It's lead flow and then being on live dials with the team and being able to learn around other people. You'll see a lot of people, they'll, they may buy leads, but then they want to dial by themselves and that never works. You have to be around other people. Every day we, we're, we're in some type of dial room and, and we're learning from each other. And that's the only way that, that you're going to get better. So, I mean, to, to do a minimum of 30,000 is at least $1,000 a week in leads. And then it's, it's being on a schedule and being on live dials. I think all the trainings that go on in the company, I mean, it all comes down to three things. It's, it's leads, it's your, your schedule and um, you know, it's, it's your mindset. And if you can do, if those things are there, then you're going to have success. And I always tell people this, I go, mindset is like first and foremost, because if you went and took someone like out of, Walmart, not that working at Walmart is bad, but they obviously have a different mindset or they wouldn't be working at Walmart. But if you brought them here and put them through all those boot camps you just showed me, their life isn't going to change it's because they don't have the correct mindset. So first and foremost, be before you buy leads or before anything else, I mean, you have to think differently. You have to work on self-development. Like you have to do that or, or none of that other stuff matters. It's not going to help you. So I always say the mindset is first and then and then leads and then your schedule. And as long as those things are in line, then, you know, there's nothing that's going to hold you back, but constantly you're always, you know, listening to things and, and to improve yourself, to make yourself think differently, because the thinking that got you to where you are today, you know, if, if you continue to think that way, you're not going to go any further. So all the decisions that you made prior to today is why you're in the situation that you're in today. So if you want to change, you have to just change the way that you think. And if you change the way you think, then you're going to change the habits that you're in. It's going to put you in a different situation. So yeah, if, if, if you want to start producing at a high level, I have all these books that are like loaded on my Audible. I remember being out in the field and being in difficult times, but I was always listening to something positive. And it's funny because you hear people say it all the time and they talk to you about how important it is to be positive. But when, sometimes when you're in a bad situation or in a negative spot or your money isn't right, it's hard to be that way, but you have to find a way to do that. And then when you once you start thinking that way and being positive, everything begins to change. So figure out what your schedule is. Don't be afraid to buy leads. 
Um, because if, if those things aren't right, then nothing's going to happen. But also every day, do something I think we probably don't talk enough about at FFL, and that self-development and listening to books and getting up early and reading. Those type of things have more of an impact than you could even imagine. Yeah, I love that. It's huge. Um, okay, so Mike, now for the people that want to build a big agency, right? They want to recruit. And a lot of times we talk about like recruiting at a high level. But... And, and we talk about like the, the recipe for sales, right? We know like we're going to get leads. This is you need to dial this, how many dials and you got to be on live dials. But for recruiting, what is your recipe for that? Like how many interviews should people be doing? Like if you decide like I really want to recruit, like what's your philosophy? How many interviews do you try to do? Where do you find your people? Like what does that look like for an agent that wants to start like recruiting at a high level? I think the first thing is always warm market, right? You bring in all the people that you know. That's obviously the easiest thing. And sometimes when people don't don't want to recruit, you end up recruiting by accident because it's almost impossible that once you find something as amazing as this, not to tell other people, especially if other people you know are in a bad situation. So sometimes recruiting will happen by default, even if you don't want to recruit. But recruiting the warm market, recruiting people that you know is is the best way to get started. I would do that first and foremost over cold market recruiting. But then once those things slow down, you need to start, you still need to talk to a lot of people. You're going to go through a lot of numbers. I mean, recruiting is just like buying leads, right? We buy a lot of leads to make the sales that we make. So we have to recruit and talk to a lot of people to get enough people that are going to stick and be able to do something. So warm market first. And then after that, we've been running for, for our group. I mean, we've been running a, a Google ads campaign where we have a lot of people that automatically book on our calendars. And those are the people that we talk to. Now, I took like a year, it's probably been a year now that I haven't, but I took like a year straight because before we all had recruiters and we thought if we just gave them, you know, ads or we gave them interviews that it would work out, right? We all kind of learned that, that that didn't work. So we fired the recruiters and a lot of us, most of the company, we all just went back to recruiting ourselves. But I spent like a whole year um, talking to those people and really figuring out what it really meant to recruit, what it meant to talk to people. And then I also learned that now when I'm recruiting, I do it completely differently. You know, before we used to go out and almost sell the opportunity, tell them how great it was, talk about how much money people can make. And I was like, I stopped all that stuff. That causes debt. That causes people that, you know, don't stay. They write bad business. And now when I talk to people, it's different. I talk to people about the ups and the downs. I talk to people about kind of the way it is in the beginning. I talk to people about spending money on leads. And now I like to tell people about all the things that can go bad. And then I still want that to see if they're going to say, okay, well, I still want to come aboard. But the way we do that now is with a lot of cold market recruiting. But we recruit a lot of cold market because we want to get to their, we want to bring in their warm market people. And like the ads that we run on, uh, through Google, like people will be on Facebook and they see how all this stuff about family first, but then they want to do their due diligence and they want to go to Google and really find family first life. So they'll go to family first or go to Google and they'll type in FFL or they'll type in what is it to be an insurance agent or what's it cost. And then our ad always comes up. Those people come to us and they, we only talk to the people that book on our calendar. We figured out a, a long time ago that of all the people that apply, if someone literally can't fill out enough information to get on our calendar, they're not going to do anything else. So we bring in a lot of people and we won't even call anyone if they don't get on our calendar. That's like the first step. Are they willing to at least type on a, a form to get on our calendar? Like people that aren't willing to type on a form, they're not going to buy leads. They're not going to go to work. They're not going to do anything. So we like left those people alone. So each and every week we have people that come in through there and we're probably interviewing like 20 to 25 people a week. But when I wanted to get back and learn how to do telesales, I hired a recruiter, but I did it differently. It wasn't hiring someone and saying, here, call these people and hire them. It was a very different process. I go, this is what I'm looking for. This is what I want. These are the questions that you should ask. Like the first day of work, he came in, he was Mike, I had 10 interviews on my calendar and I hired all 10. I got like really scared. I'm like, dude, like that is not the right way. There is a big problem if you're hiring 10 out of 10. I would expect you to hire maybe two, maybe three, like 10 out of 10 is a bad number. So it's different now. Like I don't get excited for a lot of interviews to come in. I just want us to hire good quality people. And that's like changed a lot of the people that are coming here, you know, 
but I would never recommend if you're not recruiting or if you don't know how to do it to hire a recruiter. I would never tell anyone to do, to do, to do that. It's the same way too when people want to hire a dialer. I'm like, you don't even know how to dial. How in the hell are you going to hire a dialer? You have to do it first. Or people want to hire an admin. They go, I'm hiring an admin. What should I have my admin doing? I'm like, well, your admin should be doing everything that you need to push off of you so you can sell more insurance. Like if you need to, if you don't know what to have an admin doing, like you shouldn't even hire one. Like all the jobs that I've hired people for, like I've done all of them. So I can show them exactly the way that I want it done, the way that I do it. But when I hire people to do those things, it's so I can go out and work more and sell more insurance and help more agents, not because I want to work less, right? So if you're going to hire, if you're going to hire cold market, do it first, get good at, at it first, get good at bringing people in and teaching an agent from the very beginning, like how to get their license, how to pass the test, then how to get contracted, and then how to go out there and start buying leads and making money before you would ever think about hiring someone to do that. But that's what I'd recommend, cold market first. Once that starts to slow down, don't be afraid to invest in uh, or warm market first, and don't be afraid to invest in cold market leads, but only bring in cold market people because you want to get access to more warm market people. That's the way that we do. And that's the way, what we're doing now every day. And it works. Yeah. I love that. And I would, I would agree with that. Mike, a lot of the things that we hear, and I know you probably get this too, is like brand new agent comes in and I did this at the very beginning. So I'm guilty of this. And they're like, well, I don't even know how the heck to do this thing. So are you sure I should tell my friends about it? Like, I don't, I don't even know how to do this. I need to make sure that I know how to sell first before I share this opportunity. What is like your mindset on that? I, I let people know every day I go, just plug them in. I mean, like every Saturday we do a new agent orientation. I go, you don't even have to participate. Just plug them into a new agent orientation. Put them in our Monday night, uh, uh, you know, our Monday night agency call. We have the builders call. I go then plug them into the SRS call. I go, you literally don't have to know anything. You don't have to train them. Just plug people into the system and let the system take care of them. Um, I tell people that if you want to sell insurance for the rest of your life, you can definitely do that. But if you want to build a business and build something where maybe you don't have to be in the field forever, if you want to really build something, you're going to have to do that through recruiting and bring, bringing people in. So, um, but I also tell, you know, also let people know that they don't have to, they don't have to recruit if they don't want to, but you're gonna have to do one or the other. You can do both, um, but don't be afraid about not knowing everything because there's plenty of people here that know enough to be able to take care of you. Yeah. Take care of the people that you bring in. I think that's huge too. And sometimes like for me, Mike, it was a mindset switch. Like at the beginning, I was like, well, if I don't know what I'm doing and then I hire people and then like they're better than me, like that would be bad. Then I was like, wait, if I hire people and they end up being better than me, that's actually best case scenario. Yeah. Like, cause yeah. they're going to be on my team. So why I should get a whole bunch of people that are going to be way better than me. Cause that 100%. would be the goal. I right. Think, I think it comes down to, to ego, right. As like, I don't want someone to, to not for, for them to realize, I don't know everything. You know, when you just put all that aside and say, who cares? I don't care what they think about me. I'm just going to make money. And if you don't think I know everything, that's great. You could talk to this person, talk to that person. It, it, it doesn't really matter. There's enough people here that when people come in, you're, the people you hire are going to be trained and you don't have to be all things, all people. That's what's so great about this company is anyone can do that. Like the system is here. It's built. The more people that you can take to that conference, they're going to be trained by the, the most amazing people in the company. They're going to learn everything they need to know. You don't need to train them. I mean, that's, that's awesome, right? You get paid and let other people train. Yeah, no, I love that. I'm like, please come listen to Mike, right? They leave and they're like, I, I saw this guy at the convention. This is the person that spoke out to me. And this is, a, and I'm like, perfect, right? Because then the responsibility is not on me. Like you're going to find who you connect with in the business. So Absolutely. I love that. Um, okay, Mike, this has been, I mean, phenomenal. Are you still at the office right now? Yes. Okay, so I've, obviously guys too, and I want to kind of point that out. That, and I think Mike, obviously kudos, but like, that's the difference, right? Like, I think a lot of people assume you know, hey, the, they had get these big agencies and then like they get to do like that, that's why his agency is big. That's why he's at the level he's at because it's 850 p.m. there on the East Coast and he's at the office or like on a Saturday he's doing training instead of being, you know, he does a new agent orientation every single Saturday instead of being at brunch with his friends. And like those are the things, Mike, that like was that hard for you to like sacrifice those things in the beginning or did that just, was that always like in your nature? Cause I think that's where we miss a lot. It's like, Oh, when I get this big, I'm going to be able to do less stuff. And it's like, no, you got that big because you did those things. I just, um, 
you know, I just realized it, you don't, if you're not good at something, you have to work real hard. But then I realized this too, that it, it, I don't know why it is like the people that you hire, they're going to, they're going to watch and do what you do. Um, most people will. So like, if you're not there working they're they're not going to work. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I, I don't mind being here, man. I got a big 65 inch TV up on the wall and uh, I mean, it's Monday night and yeah, I, I don't, I don't really think it's, we're, we're not out digging ditches, right? It could be a heck of a lot harder than what it is. And I like what I do. I, I live like five minutes up the road, so it's no big deal. Yeah, that's huge. Well, Mike, thank you so much. This means a lot to us. Um, I think this has been completely phenomenal and I think it gave us a lot of perspective and it's, it, you know, it's exactly what we needed. So thank you so much and we appreciate your time and, and as always, and we're excited to see you at convention. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Take care.